Okay, it looks like uh, we're live. <clears throat> so I'm going to turn off my video and mic at this point. One more minute and we'll begin. Okay. Uh, my name is Dave Hansen. I'm the chairman of the MIT Enterprise Forum of Texas in Houston. On behalf of the MIT Enterprise Forum and our 13 event partners, I'd like to welcome you all today to our second virtual uh, MIT Enterprise Forum program. Uh, our event partners for this program were the South Texas Society of Plastics Engineers, Global Energy Mentors, Rice Alliance, <clears throat> the World Affairs Council, 
University of Houston Energy, University of St. Thomas, a Houston Community College, Z Labs, Polish Investment Trading Agency, Women in AI, Indonesian Council, Asian Chamber of Commerce, SoGal Foundation, Indonesian American Chamber of Commerce, and Bridging Value. I'd like to thank all our partners for uh, promoting this program, which I think that you're gonna to find to be fantastic. Um, as I mentioned, this is our second uh, virtual program. Our first one was in, on February 3rd. We had our business forecast uh, program uh, with Bob Charlet, publisher of the Houston Business Journal, John Duca, who is a uh, vice president in the Federal Reserve, and Boyd Nash Stacy, who is a senior economist. Uh, you'll see this, the uh, recording of this program uh, on this YouTube channel, and I would highly recommend it. It, it, was, it was really great. Uh, we had like 398 people signing up for the program. Today, with all the turmoil uh, caused by COVID and the oil downturn, it seems only appropriate that we should have Bill Higgs talking with you uh, today about creating great company culture uh, that better allows companies to survive the downturns and, and profit during the normal times. Before we get started though, uh, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about the MIT Enterprise Forum and uh, then we'll, I'll introduce Bill Higgs and uh, we'll have uh, the program. So let me start off with uh, just giving you a little bit of background on the MIT Enterprise Forum. Okay, let me get this started. Okay, our program today with Bill Higgs, he's gonna be talking about creating great company culture. Um, and it is very typical of uh, the programs that we have in the MIT Enterprise Forum. Now, the MIT Enterprise Forum, we're one of 21 worldwide chapters uh, that's associated with MIT. It was started by MIT alums here in Houston. Our chapter was started in 1984. So we've been around for a long time. What we try and do is give back to the local communities and talk about technology, entrepreneurship, and economics. And we do this with flagship programs like what you're seeing today. Uh, we have a new venture clinic where we help startup companies uh, polish their presentations as they're getting ready to go out and present for money. And then we have networking socials. Um, this last year, we have not had any networking socials and I think it's gonna be a while yet uh, in 2021 before we have a networking social again. So uh, we're limited at this point to new venture clinics and flagship programs. Now, uh, one thing I should mention to you, you don't need to be an MIT alumni to be part of our organization. Uh, we're an all volunteer uh, organization. I'm a good example. Uh, I did not go to MIT. I went to UC Berkeley and uh, they let me be the chairman of the MIT Enterprise Forum here in Houston. It's been a lot of fun and very rewarding. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about our next program that will be coming up here uh, shortly. Uh, we're looking to schedule it for late April or early May. It will be a virtual program and will be on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And we have a, a professor from uh, UC Berkeley who'll be telling you about uh, what's been going on around the world uh, to look for strange signals coming in uh, that could possibly be uh, other forms of intelligence. But in addition to this program, we're also working, uh, see if we can't uh, develop some programs on drones, cybersecurity, talking about the second machine age, um, which is really computers, uh, the top 10 advances in astronomy and diagnosing and treating cancer. All those are programs that uh, we're potentially working on. If you have an idea for a program for us, please get in touch with me. We'd love to uh, work with you and see if we can't put on a program together. Speaking of 
programs. Here are some of our past programs that we've had with the MIT Enterprise Forum. Uh, it has spanned a wide variety of subjects. Our most popular program, and these are all videos of, uh, of the program. Our top program was with MIT professor Donald Sadaway talking about making liquid metal batteries for storing electricity on the grid. Uh, we've had more than 30,000 views on YouTube for that program. I like Bennett Greenspan's uh, video on talking about DNA testing for genealogy. Uh, Family Tree DNA here in Houston with Bennett Greenspan was the first company in the world to do DNA testing for genealogy. And they are still one of the leaders uh, in the world. Uh, we've had programs on vulnerability of uh, US electrical grid. That's very appropriate here in Houston right now. <laughs> um, but we were talking before about the effect of EMP, electromagnetic pulses from the solar storms or a possible rogue uh, high altitude nuclear blast. So there are a lot of good programs out there. I encourage you to uh, go to our website and access them. I'd like to say thank you to our annual sponsors. Westlake Chemical has been a sponsor for probably the last eight or so years. James Chow is an MIT graduate and he's chairman of the board of uh, Westlake Chemicals. Uh, Houston uh, Business Journal has been a very good uh, working sponsor with us. Uh, Bob Charlet, who's the publisher there at the Houston Business Journal, has participated in our business forecast luncheons every January. Uh, BBVA Compass has also participated in our business forecast luncheons. Houston Tech, well, it's not Houston Technology Center anymore. It's Houston Exponential has allowed us to use their facilities for new venture clinics. Uh, the MIT, we work closely with the MIT club and have often joint programs with them, like Professor Sadaway was a good example. Joe Garman has been our photographer at a lot of our events. And Rice Alliance has been a good partner, and we've done uh, cooperative programs with them uh, in the past, too. So um, that's all I wanted to say about the MIT Enterprise Forum. Let me talk a little bit now uh, about uh, uh, wh what we're going to do today. I'm going to stop sharing this. Um, I'd like to introduce Bill Higgs. Uh, he is, uh, he was an Eagle Scout, West Point graduate, uh, worked uh, after graduating from West Point. He served his uh, time in the Army as an officer, uh, heading up an engineering uh, company, um, battalion. Uh, he came to Houston uh, after serving in the Army and worked as an engineer here in Houston for a while. And then in 1987, uh, he decided that to, he and two other people decided they'd like to start their own engineering company, see if they couldn't do things better and have some fun uh, along the ways. In addition, Bill's not your typical engineer. Uh, he has had a numerous different assignments in Mustang, one of which has been uh, vice president of, in charge of sales and marketing. And that's not typically typically what you think of engineers doing, but he uh, he's he's very effective in that. I've known Bill um, through Boy Scouts. Our sons went to scouting together, and we were assistant scoutmasters. Uh, we ended up uh, hiking Philmont together with the scouts, trekking across Iceland, and even rafting down the Grand Canyon. Uh, Bill's a great adventure, and he's a lot of fun to go on these adventures with. Mustang Engineering uh, was purchased um, in 2000 by the Wood Group. Um, so they started in 1987, purchased by the Wood Group in uh, 2000 with the idea that this allowed them to expand around the world and access uh, more markets. Bill continued to work uh, with the Wood Group and Mustang Engineering for another eight years to help it grow into the company that it is today. He's written two books and lectured around the country. Uh, the, he's lectured on his experience at Mustang Engineering and the importance of company culture 
is one of the things that made Mustang so successful. His new book, Cultural Code Champions, is featured by Forbes. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bill Higgs to you. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Uh, culture is very important to me. When we started the company, uh, I think I learned a lot of my culture things from working with rangers in the Army. I was king of the pits in ranger school, so pretty gung-ho. But I like that team mentality. And in the Army, culture is considered the flip side of leadership. So if you're going to be a good leader, you need to develop the culture. And what we did at Mustang and going from zero to a billion dollars in revenue before I left, second and third generation took it to $5 billion. But when we were small in the first three years, I remember almost everything that happened like it was yesterday. If you're in a startup, you know how intense that is. But we wanted to have some fun. And it turned out starting to have some fun allowed us to intentionally create a culture that differentiated us. And I'm gonna share a, an interview here where Jenny Buchholz with Haven Creative, she implemented all of our culture steps in her company. She's gonna interview me so that I can give you some specific things that you can do to help with culture. And it's not just for you as individuals or to help your family or your community, but your business will benefit from a better culture because culture also includes having a repeatable process, selling while the shop is full, figuring out how to take care of your clients better than your competition. Our bottom line was four times the bottom line in the industry, primarily because we reduced turnover from 45% to less than 5%. And we also increased our productivity by keeping people long-term. All of those monies went to the bottom line. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to Dave. We'll show you this video. It's about 40 minutes or so. Uh, feel free on the side on YouTube to type in any questions you have. We'll have a Q&A at the end of this. Thanks again for joining. Hello, my name is Jenny Buchold and I'm the owner of Haven Creative, a branding and strategic communications agency based in the Charlotte area. Much of what we do at the Haven is focused on creating company culture and strategic communications. And many times when I work with CEOs, you really can tie into your bottom line and create an impact. Uh, so it's my pleasure to have with us today Bill Higgs, who is the Forbes Books Culture Code Champion author, and really over the last five years, I've had the pleasure of working with him. So much of his culture building tactics I've used in my own organization, which has led us to scale 125% almost year over year to where we are now. And really because I follow these steps and I'm really excited to hear from Bill today and go through what these steps are and how they're going to help impact your bottom line and your company culture. Bill, I'll send it to you. Well, thanks, Jenny. It's really going to be fun talking to the MIT Engineering Forum. Uh, big thank you to Dave Hansen for picking me. And we used to be neighbors, so he watched us grow Mustang from zero to a billion dollars in Houston, Texas. Uh, a tough thing to do. But there were three companies in Houston I felt had great culture. Southwest Airlines that everybody knows about their people-oriented culture. Compact Computers, who eventually sold, and Mustang Engineering. All three had tremendous growth, and they would all point to their people first culture for why they were able to do that. So culture is a big thing for me. My background, airborne ranger, gung-ho in the army, uh, got out, came in a civilian world, and people were working eight hours a day going home, and nobody knew each other. And so I wanted to try and bring some of that to the civilian world and uh, Jenny and I are going to talk a little bit about things that we did in order to do that. You, so you brought up Houston, perfect segue. Uh, they've been hit hard. I mean the oil price war, pandemic, 
economic shutdown, series of hurricanes. I mean, it's been an unprecedented year as if we've heard that word enough, right? But what advice can you give companies facing this type of crisis right now? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Houston has been hammered. There's no doubt about it. In the 80s, we went through a 10-year downturn in oil patch from 82 to 92. I would say economically, it was probably worse than it is right now in Houston because 1,200 savings and loans went out, out of business. Uh, there were foreclosures on every street. We had friends who had to move out of Texas in order to find a job. And during that time, we started Mustang in the middle of it. Uh, figured it couldn't go down any further. We were wrong. We started before the end of that downturn. But one of the things that we brought with us, and we called it no fate leadership. And what we felt is that if you build the right type of company with the right culture and follow the seven steps that we'll talk a little bit about today, there's no fate that you have to go up and down just because your industry does. And it's actually when you're in these huge downturns like this, there's a lot of opportunity all around you, but you have to, as a leader, you have to grab a hold of it and you have to, Jenny, one of her favorite sayings is, by the inch, it's a cinch. So what you need to do in a downturn is start picking little things that people can do to start working your way out of it and show people what you're doing in order to work out of that downturn and celebrate the little wins. If you celebrate the little wins, people will start getting that energy back. They'll realize you're going to do okay. But there's a number of things. One is plug all the holes in the bucket. So first thing everybody did during this downturn was plug the holes in the bucket, conserve cash, cut all your outgo. Well, what we did in the downturn in the 80s is we took notes on all of that. So when we came out and back into the good times, we kept checking every six months, hey, are we doing some of these things we had plugged the hole in and going back to the way we used to? And if you can stay lean in the good times, not get fat and happy, it's a total game changer. The next downturn, you're going to be more solid. You're not going to go down as far as everyone else does. The other thing you can do during the downturn is there'll be some really good people come available because they'll be dissatisfied with how their leadership treated that downturn. And they might not, they might still have a job, but they may feel like, hey, it's time for me to find another place. Or what happened for us is they were sitting at the house because the oil patch was so far down. We could just pick them up if we could find work. So it's also a time to be recruiting and finding those team members that you're going to want. But look at it as an opportunity. Don't go, oh, woe is me and spiral down. You want to spiral your people up. And even if you're just getting them back to neutral, that's a win in a downturn. I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recap some of those things that I, I heard you say that I also did. Plugging the holes, celebrating the wins, you know, conserving your cash where you can, staying lean, and getting the good people also did that. A few people were laid off, and I snagged them right up. Uh, great advice there. And then what the, I think the biggest thing it's hard to do now is that we're working from home, right? So we're no longer in our offices like we used to be. And I found a struggle in trying to keep our company culture alive. I mean, so how do you think that this is new work from home environment has impacted company culture? Well, one of the things that you and I are doing right now, Jen, is talking over Zooms. <laughs> I'm still right. figuring out how to do this and trying to look at the camera and not be wandering all over the place. But it, it's hard sometimes for your personality to come across in what mm -hmm. you're trying to do. But work from home, I think, is a perfect opportunity to increase communications, which is one of my first steps. All problems are communication problems. And the first thing that happens in a downturn, like we're in right now, is the silos are busted. Because now everybody's in the soup together. And we're over Zoom and we're talking. And so everybody has the same problems. They got their kids running around in the background and their spouse is working on something. They're having to figure out what the new normal is during this downturn and then what it's going to be like coming out of it. So the key thing that's happening is I think every leader knows their people, 
knows their home situation, knows their family situation better than they've ever known it. So there's more communication than they've ever had. Take advantage of that. We built an entire company on squeezing the handoffs between people. And what's going to happen when you're working from home is you have to over communicate those handoffs. So a person's going to expect something on Thursday, you're going to want to give it to them and you want to give it to them right the first time. So you're going to say, Hey, I'm planning on doing it with this software. I'm planning to do it to this level of detail. And you're going to really work that over zoom. So when you go do that project and you hand it off, Hey, they're going to be ready for it. <laughs> so they're not going to be distracted and have it sit there for three days because you're going to be talking to them and handing it off. And it's going to be in the format where they can just take it and use it. That kind of a handoff, what we found is 30% schedule and 30% cost is saved through really good handoffs. So work in those communications, you can do that in this work from home environment. But then you also have to have some fun. And uh, the fun comes like we always would wear crazy hats. And you might not believe this, but we had, you know, Shell and Exxon and Mobile and Texaco and all these people working in our office. And on each project, they would have a theme, like one of them might be pirates, one of them were the Holsteins, but they had a hat. And during the monthly report out, everybody who got up to report had to put that hat on. And it might sound crazy, but when the head of Exxon puts a crazy hat on and gets up to report on the Exxon part of a project, it just puts everybody on the same playing field. Now you feel like, wow, we're on the same team. We're all pulling together. That's not a client that I can't talk to. I want to make that person a hero. And that was like one of our catchphrases was to make everyone a hero. And so hats can do that. You can do that on Zoom. You can do some funny faces. Do some things to break it up to where you're not just reporting out and it's just a bunch of faces in blocks, but have some fun with it and create that camaraderie. What, what I learned in the Army, so I was a gung-ho airborne ranger, king of the hand-to-hand -hand combat pits in ranger school. And one of the things they taught us on the battlefield is that energy and enthusiasm is a force multiplier. And when I got in the civilian world, I didn't feel that energy and enthusiasm. But part of culture is that communication and building that team spirit to get that energy and enthusiasm. When people come to work each day, that they want to put themselves into it. And there's some other steps that we'll cover in Culture Code Champions that are going to help you win the hearts and the minds of your people. I wanted to jump on your on what you said with the Zoom. I've also noticed, you know, the creative fun Zoom backgrounds, having a happy birthday background. One of our clients recently found out she had breast cancer and all of us logged in with the pink background, you know, showing our support for mm -hmm. her. So you can definitely have fun with Zoom these days, you know, doing the, the team thing. And that helps engage people. Yeah. It, it really does. Yeah. Um, it seems like all of these steps are part of building an intentional culture. You've always told me that every company has a culture. It's how is it, what kind of culture is it in building intentional culture? And I feel like culture was such the forefront of conversation coming into 2020. Everyone was focused on building more of an intentional culture. And then we got whacked with this pandemic. So <laughs> what are the business benefits, you know, of still putting time and effort into culture? What's the benefit? Well, I I totally agree. It, it's hard for people to remember what the last half of 2019 was like, but try to put yourself back. Employment or unemployment was down at 4%, 3.5%. Everybody was fighting over people and fighting over talent. Mm -hmm. And what the board were finding in different companies and CEOs were finding is that companies that had a great culture they couldn't go rip any people out of those companies. And they found that if they're a company that had a good culture, they weren't losing any people when everybody was trying to steal folks back and forth in the last half of 2019. So if you remember, it was all about how can you get that talent and get those people. So going into 2020, boards across the United States were saying, hey, we need to focus on culture in 2020. And Forbes picked me because 
my partner and I were labeled in the oil industry worldwide by Upstream Magazine. We were labeled the kings of culture worldwide in the oil industry. And Forbes saw that, saw our growth, saw what we had done. Uh, we felt we had the growth that we had year over year, similar to what Jenny talked about her company. Then we felt we had that growth because of the culture. So Forbes wanted me to show people, how do you create an intentional culture? Now the boards would not be interested in an intentional culture unless it was going to help the bottom line. So key thing, the basic reason for having an intentional culture is that it's going to double the bottom line. In our case, we were four times the industry average bottom line. So I say easily you can double your bottom line with an intentional culture. And the way that happens is you don't have the turnover that your competitors do. In Houston, turnover was 35 to 45% a year. New hires, 60% would be gone within the first six months. They would be off to a new company because there's so much competition for good talent in Houston. Our turnover rate was less than 5%. Many years, it was less than 2%. Studies have been done. It's fifteen to forty-five thousand dollars per new hire for you to change out a person and train them. All that money goes to the bottom line if you're not losing your people. The other thing that happens, though, by preventing turnover, or stopping the turnover, is you get better at what you do. You get more efficient, and that efficiency also drops dollars to the bottom line. So just those two things were why the boards were pushing the CEOs and the HR departments, figure out how to get intentional about culture so we can be more productive than our competitors and have a better bottom line than our competitors. And as we're talking about different steps, like opening up the communication, creating the team everybody wants to join, and, and a third step would be to use hard copy communication. You're gonna find that these are very cheap and very easy to implement. One of my favorite examples, Jenny, on hard copy communication is to send the monthly newsletter home in hard copy to the spouse. You'd be amazed at what happened. Normally people just email that to their employees, don't worry about the house. If they do email it to the house, people will read the first paragraph and then they'll exit out of it and move on to something else. You get a hard copy in their hand, they're gonna open it, they're gonna look at it, they're gonna look at the pictures, they're gonna show the kids, they're gonna see activities that are coming up. And what you're starting to do is you're starting to win the hearts and the minds now of the family at the house. So when your employee needs to work an extra few hours or work on a Saturday, they're gonna start knowing, hey, this is the best job my husband or wife has ever had hey, mom or dad's really happy, they're going to be supportive of them coming and doing what you need to do to get, get things done. But that's just one small example, but there's a lot of small things that you can do to really turn the tide on creating that intentional culture instead of letting the culture just be whatever it happens to be by the people that you hired. So one thing as an entrepreneur, as always on my mind, is growing my company and working on the company. So having to focus on building an intentional culture feels overwhelming. And so <laughs> one thing I learned in my entrepreneur group, we were chatting yesterday, that we don't want to be responsible for it. We learned we don't have to. We can assign someone. And it's something that you say we should do anyway. So tell me Absolutely. more about how to assign someone or what that does to build culture. Well, the the thing that my partner and I found is any initiative that we created, so we went from zero to a billion dollars, so from three people to 6,500 people. And you can imagine the growth and the change that we went through. In our industry, we were doing offshore oil platforms in 50 foot of water when we started. And within seven years, we were doing them in 5,000 feet of water and they were floating cities. So our growth and our technical growth, everything was nuts. And what we found is any initiative that we started had a half-life of about six weeks. And within 12 weeks, it'd be gone and everybody would be back to doing what they were doing before, which wasn't acceptable or we wouldn't have had the initiative. 
And what we found is that if we assigned a champion to an initiative and it was part of their job description, then it got the continuous focus and things were happening every week on it. And that initiative would become a habit. And then we got better at what we did. And so yeah, you as the CEO or as the head of HR, you don't have to drive all of this. What we did is we found champions at all different levels in the company. And just give you an example. You can do a paper airplane flying contest. And what we would do is we would get what we called our young guns. So these are your millennials and younger. So we had a young guns program to train and bring those people along. And we'd have their mentor and maybe somebody else. So we'd have three departments of people involved. And they would set up this airplane flying contest. So they put flyers out. They get everybody motivated. They talk about what the rules were going to be, when it was going to be, how we were going to fly them, what the prizes would be. Well, then what would happen is the employees home at the kitchen table and they're looking up on YouTube how to make paper airplanes. And so they're with their kids, with their spouse, they're folding these paper airplanes. And the day that they come in to fly the paper airplane, I, I, I knew some personal assistants who came in and they were feeling a lot of pressure from home to win this paper airplane flying contest when they came in. But then over lunch, you're just flying the paper airplanes, you're taking a lot of pictures, you're having camaraderie, silos are busted, everybody's in the same room, they're talking, they're doing something fun. That's starting to build communication and culture and it costs very little, but you can also see the people that had to run that. It's exercising their leadership capability, their organizational capability. And through a lot of these activities, we found leaders in our design group and our uh, personal assistants and our purchasing group, we found people with more leadership skills than we realized. And we were able to start honing them and move them up in the organization to where they would end up on corporate staff 10 years later. So a lot of benefits come very cheap, very simple to do, but you need to assign a champion. And, and I would start with step one, open the communication up, assign a champion, uh, in culture code champions, we say hand them a baton because it's a handoff. And so have a little ceremony. Everybody knows this is the champion for this communication thing. Support them. They'll pick a couple of assistants to help them do it and go for six or eight weeks just working on that step number one. My book gives you a lot of samples of how to do it. My webpage gives you a bunch of samples of how to do it. Look at those and figure out how to do it in your organization. It's very simple. After six or eight weeks, when that's becoming a habit, then move to step two, creating that sense of team. And by that time, you will have identified some more champions. Uh, Jenny, would you like me to explain how to find champions? Sure. That's, that's one of the questions I get all the time. How do you find these people? So one of the things, my, my kids got me a little putt-putt thing for Christmas one year, and I'm putting in the living room. I said, oh, this would be fun. Let's go do this at work. So we set up teams that were cross-departmental, had 15 teams of five to six people each, and they all designed a hole, and we put them up in the hallways, and then we had a putt-putt golf tournament. And on each one of those five or six-person teams, somebody would end up leading it, and they were gung-ho, and they put energy into it, and they got the people, and they rallied them. <laughs> that's the person. That's a potential champion right there because they've got the energy for it, they're throwing themselves into it. They'll have the energy and enthusiasm that brings other people. So use some of these first simple things to identify who's got that energy, who's connected, who's going to work it. Very cool. Um, so what we've talked about so far, though, like I started off the conversation, seems like a lot of marketing fluff and games, right? So it's building a sense of team, communication, huggy, warm party thing. But then we're talking engineers. We're talking yeah. to CFOs, CEOs. What are some of the more business-oriented steps that you could share with them? Because I'm sure that's a question on their mind. Oh, oh yeah. It's not all whole hands and hum. Although right. that, that's a part of it. There's no <laughs> doubt. I am also an Eagle Scout, and uh, a lot of the Boy Scouts fun stuff is, is what I tried to bring to work. But one of the other steps is to create a repeatable process. And I remember, so we started in the mid 80s and the pipeline industry had become deregulated. And we decided we wanted to go in the pipeline industry. We went in and we saw 
what they charge for engineering of a pipeline. A pipeline connects at one end to something, the other end to something else, and it's just a straight piece of pipe going through the dirt in between. And they would charge 10 to $20 million of engineering <laughs> to design that. So we took a look and what happened was under regulatory, the more you spent on the pipeline, the more you could charge the consumer. So engineering just got out of control. And so we took a pipeline that would have 400 drawings and we were able to do it with 15 drawings and four spreadsheets. And so we just dropped the bottom out of that cost and developed a repeatable process where we could do it over and over way cheaper than anybody else could do it. And once we'd done it a little bit, we had go by. So we wouldn't reinvent the wheel. We would reuse it. And one of my, I, I use lots of fun phrases to try and get a point across to people. And so Higgs one of, yeah, my Higgs, favorite. yeah, a lot, a lot of Higgsisms, but <laughs> one of the ones I love is this process engineer had designed a pump and he took two extra months to design this pump and he throws it into purchasing and says, go bid this pump. So purchasing goes out, bids the pump. Six weeks later, they have all the bids in and they come back to engineering and they say, hey, this pump that you designed, it's made out of unobtainium. Now, unobtainium is like a new material on a periodic table for all you engineers out there. That means it cannot be obtained anywhere in the world the way it's designed. And so what you need to look at in your companies and use that term unobtainium, where are you creating unobtainium? If that engineer had said, hey, this is a tump pump application and got with purchasing and they brought three vendors in and they worked and designed that pump together, then they could have bid to those three pump manufacturers and it all would have gone smoothly and gotten it right the first time. Remember, I talked about the handoffs. That was a very sloppy handoff, wasted eight weeks of time. All of that rolls into schedule. So... Look for unobtainium. Unobtainium is happening due to silos. It's happening due to communication. It's due to not having a repeatable process where you reuse things that you've already created. A lot of your engineers out there, and Jenny's dad was an engineer, so she knows what I'm talking about. You need to box in the artsy part of whatever your company is. There's an artsy part in it's where the talented people are that are creating something. In our case, the engineers were the artsy part, and we had to box those engineers in. If you don't box them in, they'll just keep engineering and engineering and engineering, and schedule will just keep going. And so you use schedule, you use go-bys, you use a kickoff meeting to box them in and get them to commit, and then you get better handoffs. One thing you used to say too is that that kickoff was so important that your team would have almost 30% of the project done by kickoff. And that's always resonated with me. So it's like, how much can you plan and prepare and pull past work so that you are more prepared at the kickoff? Uh, especially when you're working with a client and the client, you need decisions that stick from a client, but a client's sort of scared to make those decisions. So if you can bring a bunch of go-bys and really Show them, hey, this is what the end product's going to look like. Do you like what this looks like or how would you tweak it? They're all good at looking at something and tweaking it. They're not mm -hmm. good about just talking about what they might want. Yep. And so, again, bringing those go-bys in, bringing those samples in and saying, this is how we're going to create. That's really working on a much better communication and getting good decisions that are going to stick that allow you to go and do a good job. One thing also, and I was thinking about the steps, is that you always said to sell while the shop is full. So when you have a repeatable process, it's much easier to keep selling because you know it's taken care of on the operations side. Yes, well, I love the phrase sell while the shop is full. Uh, a lot of, especially mid-sized and smaller companies, when the management team starts to get overloaded because they've got too much work, they like turn the spigot off. I say, man, we got to, we can't bring yeah. in any more stuff because we're loaded to the gills. And what happens is then you start to work that off and then they say, turn sales back on. But sales doesn't just turn on and off easily. And a great example I, I have, is, and we tried to stay about 10% overloaded because if your people are a little bit overloaded, 
you're going to automatically look for more efficient ways to get things done in order to make schedules. If you try to molly coddle them and make it easy for them to work and not stress them, then your company's just going to not be as good. That stress actually helps people come up with innovative ways to do things. But I remember one time we were small, we were about a 50 person company. And in January, there's no work awarded in our industry in Houston. But on a Friday in January, we're awarded seven projects, three of them for brand new clients, four of them for old clients. So over the weekend, we're figuring out how are we going to do all this work? It's too much stuff. And the four for old clients, we said, we've got to take those because that's how you lock a client in. You do repeat work and repeat work cost you nothing from a sales standpoint. It's just your relationship. You did a good job. They're coming back. So we didn't want those clients to go try anybody else. So boom, we're taking those four. Of the three new ones, we had to get let one of them go. And so we were going to let Pete Peterson's job with Bell North go because we knew that he knew other engineering firms where he could get it done. So called him on Monday, said, can we come talk to you on Tuesday? Because we wanted to do it in person. So I went with the project manager. And back then there was no security. So we just walked down the hallway at Pete Peterson's office and we look in there and his conference table's got eight people around it. And so I'm in the hallway and I, hey, Pete, come on out here. She comes out in the hallway. I said, Pete, we just wanted to come and personally tell you we couldn't do your project because we were awarded too much stuff on Friday. And he says, Bill, these people are all here for the kickoff meeting. I thought we were having the kickoff meeting now. And I'm like, oh boy. Time to dance like a butterfly, sting like a bee. <laughs> Time to dance. And I said, well, Pete, your job is pretty standard. And we've done a, we had done a lot of cross-training. Cross-training is huge in your company. It helps bust silos. But we had trained our purchasing people to where they were 60% as good as an engineer. And so I told Pete, I said, this is all standard equipment. If you'll let us, we could have a kickoff meeting now and let's nail all the equipment We'll put it into purchasing because purchasing is available right now. They'll go out for bids and six weeks from now when we've got all the bids in, engineering will be coming available from these other projects. They can evaluate the bids we can award and get your project done. And my project manager is sitting there watching me dance and he's rolling his eyes and Pete says, let's do it. Well, we did that project and we did it for 70% of our bid man hours and we did that because we just did what was needed because we were overloaded. And that showed me there's lots of ways to skin a cat, challenge operations. How can you get this job done? Because by doing it, we now added another client that could give us a job 10 months later. You never know when they're going to hit with another project. And if you can broaden that base, it's going to help you. So selling while the shop is full, is a good thing for your company, but the other thing it does for your people is a huge thing. And I called it, and these are again, Higgsisms, little phrases. I call it job on the corner of the desk. So I would go into an engineer or a drafter and I'd put the next job on their desk and I'd say, would you hurry and finish up that project so that you can get on this next one? Now understand the first five years, we were in a major downturn and in a downturn, engineers do not finish work because then, they're fired, <laughs> they're let go. So they just drag it out. Well, what I was doing is I putting a job on the corner desk, say, hurry up and finish this. All of a sudden we got the reputation as the only engineering firm that was finishing things and getting it done. But think about that person. Think about that drafter, that engineer, that purchasing person who is working on something and has the next job there. Now you've got their total attention to get into your culture because they're not worried about their job. They're not listening at the coffee machine. Hey, where are the jobs? What's going on out there? They're not answering phone calls when a headhunter is calling them. You now totally have them because, hey, I've got the next job. Now they're free to engage in your culture. And that's a huge step because you need them you need to come from your heart, but you need to get their heart and mind into your culture. And they can't do that if they're worried about their job. Yep. Great point. And also thinking about the people that you have in your organization that are willing to keep working for you and pushing. And you always mention like 
finding the right people is so important to the culture and making sure they're the right fit. So how do you find the right people when you're really busy and there's everything going on? It's a, it's a total chicken and the egg thing. Yeah. I want to have this fantastic culture, but to have this fantastic culture and do these products, I need like fantastic people. So how are we going to do it? Well, what we did, and I, I like to go back to the early days. So we were in a downturn. We were able to get some work and we were able to hire some just solid people that stayed for 30 years at Mustang and grew with it from zero to 15,000 people and grew from being in charge of two people to being in charge of 2,500 people. But how do you find those people? One of the first people we hired was David Sneed heading up design. And after about a year, he had 10 people in his drafting design room. And he went to each of them and he said, who are the 10 best designers that you know in the industry? And those went on his list. And he told me just a couple of years ago, he says, Bill, I want you to know that I had 10 people. I got 10 names from each one of them. I kept going until they were 10 different names from each person. So I had 100 names. He says, within three years, I had hired all but three of those names out of the Houston industry. Wow. <laughs> That's and here's my Higgses and what I call that because we were a horsey company or Mustang blue horse is we call that operation horse thief. Get your people who have your DNA. They're working at the level you want to work. They're communicating the way you want to communicate. They're involved in the activities and the culture. They know it's differentiating. They know they're on the team that everybody else wants to join. They want to keep that going. So ask them and say, who do you know? that's like you in this industry. And if you're a designer, I really like asking designers, who are the best engineers and purchasing people you know? Because they always have to clean up after those people. And that Operation Horse Thief, we had a new hire breakfast. So we did a new hire breakfast every month for new people, bring all of our managers, the founders. We talk about our culture and what they were coming into and what was expected of them. And at that new hire breakfast, We'd say, you're here because of Operation Horse Thief. Thank you for choosing Mustang. And you got to thank your people because your people are essentially volunteers. If they're good, they can work anywhere else. So thank them for joining your company, which we did. We said, and since we're feeding you breakfast, would you also give us five names of the best people you know in the industry? And those would go on to our department hit list for when we needed to grow. And uh, that allowed us to, we could high grade. You need to high grade in the good times and the bad. High grade your people. When times are really good, you're saying, hey, I just need the hands. But that's, that's not good. You still need to be high grading. If some people aren't performing, when times are good, that's the easiest time to let them go. They can go find another job. It, it doesn't hurt as bad. And get somebody that's on this hit list this, uh, that has your DNA. In the downturns, the same thing, like Jenny said earlier, you can find some of your best people in a downturn. And some of those people that are on your hit list, maybe they would not normally leave the company where they are, mm -hmm. but you can tickle them in a downturn and find that, hmm, yep, they've loosened up. Yeah, they're a little bit interested in moving and switch somebody out because your job is to create the absolute best team for working together and creating a great environment, for taking care of your clients and making them a hero, but also taking care of your suppliers and making your suppliers a hero. And it needs to yeah, go that in, in all, all direction. And we call making a hero, it, it's like where you work to set them up for success. So a supplier, we would give a very good detailed bid package and a very fair bid evaluation to where when they won the work, they knew they were gonna make money on it and that they weren't gonna to have to get into the contingency portion of their bid price. So if they could make their normal profit and turn their contingency into profit, that salesperson and that person working in that supply organization, they're a hero, they're making good money for the company. For the client, we could reduce their total installed costs. They're not worried about the engineering, but the cost of the entire project. We could change the cost and schedule by 
most huge projects and we were getting into five billion dollar size projects that, that took four years most projects like that go 30 percent over in cost and schedule if you bring it in 10 to 30 percent under that client's going to get promoted and we had a lot of clients that ended up becoming area managers executive vice presidents all because of the performance that's that's making heroes outside and then internally it was busting those silos working those handoffs taking care of each other communication yep back to making heroes so that i think we just walked you through step one through six pretty much with all those tips so what i want to hear like if you could explain step seven of the book when and uh why it's important yeah, so step one and six, each one of those, take, take your time and implement it well and get a champion and maybe after a year, switch that champion out to their second in command to keep it fresh and keep it moving. But each one of those steps will start to build a company that's having double the bottom line, reducing the turnover, increasing your efficiency. And what happens, so now your people have not had to change jobs twice in the last three years. And so now they've got more energy. Their family's engaged with the company and they've got more energy. I had people in our fourth year, I had a spouse come up to me at a Christmas party and try to get my attention because I'm talking to everybody and said, Bill, just listen to me. My spouse has changed since coming to Mustang. They get up in the morning and they're gung ho. They're ready to go to work. They come home, they still have energy. They're engaging more with me. They're engaging more with the kids. They're even talking about going to church on Sunday. So whatever your leadership team is doing at Mustang, keep doing it. And if you think about the purpose of a company, it, it's to take care of those people and to perform. It doesn't matter what your company does or what your church organization does or the Boy Scouts, whatever organization, creating this culture is going to change lives. Well, now you've got the energy, then we started to go into the community. And so step seven is to give back to your community. And there's lots of opportunities for that. So we did private sector initiative where we helped fix homes. We did homes for humanity, just lots of different things. We did toys for tots with the Marines. Well, what we found is people would volunteer to run those things and some of our personal assistants one of our designers would run the PSI thing. And we would find this leadership capability. And our, our goal in our culture was to create leaders of character top to bottom. And so what we found is mid-level, people down in the trenches would lead and help run these outside community activities. And at the outside community activity, Everybody's bunched together. All the silos are busted. Everybody's talking. You're meeting family members. We had kids working on these houses. And you're pulling together as a team, and it becomes more of a family. So when people come back into the organization, those pictures are in the newsletter. Those pictures are up at the coffee bar. There's positive things to talk about. And you're spiraling the organization up while you're helping the community. And some of those people would get identified again to start going up higher in the organization, increasing their pay, increasing their responsibility. You know, for some of them, we just say, hey, will you do two things a year different in the company? Because they didn't want that leadership and responsibility full-time in the organization, but they wouldn't mind taking on a project internally to help out. So step seven, I think is huge. It's giving back to the community, but it'll come back to you 10 times in your organization. Makes a lot of sense. And also another one that I borrowed from Mustang, uh, we have Haven Heroes. We give back to the same. Yeah, you guys do all kinds of runs and things oh, like that. We and also uh, make mavens. I stole that from Making Heroes. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, the other thing that really used to bug me, okay, during a major downturn and a lot of you're in it, you'd go to the coffee bar and the things that were posted at the coffee bar were the government regulations. Yeah. And at the coffee bars where all the negative stuff would happen. Hey, who, who got a raise? What's happening in these other companies? Where are the projects? And what I say is take all those government regulations and go put them in a dark corner of the hallway somewhere and put fun stuff. And so I got my sales and marketing people involved 
I said, one of your jobs, yeah, you're supposed to go out, meet clients, find work and bring it in. But another part of your job is to make sure that we reduce turnover. Because if we reduce turnover, it's going to be easier for you to sell. So my marketing and my salespeople, they're gung-ho. they got a lot of energy. And they've got a lot of capability for doing pictures and sayings and helping people with themes and hats and stuff like that. So they were in charge of what was up at the coffee bar and keeping that fresh. And they were also in charge of helping teams create little cultures within those teams that work the communication. So use your sales and your marketing people just with their little finger. They can do monster amount of things to help you. So I will say we're kind of wrapping this up here. It was pretty much like drinking from a fire hose. If you haven't uh, been with Bill, I've had the pleasure, like I said, of the last five years and each year learning more and more to where it was finally applicable to my business. So the book was super helpful to be able to follow along those steps. But if, if we had to leave everyone with one action that they could take tomorrow to change their culture, what, what would that be, Bill? I'd say one of the simplest one is most people are doing a newsletter, do the hard copy newsletter and start sending that to the house. Have some people that are getting the input into it, make it a fun thing, make it something that they want to flip through, flip through and read. The title of that newsletter should be some phrase. Like for us, it was the Mustang motion newsletter. And we had a song Mustang motion that we did to the song locomotion but Mustang Motion, we said, we're always going to be moving. We're always going to be changing. Get used to it. It's the way we are. Your office, it's not going to be in the same place six months from now that it is right now. The project isn't going to be the same. The people are going to be moving. We wanted people so used to change that what would kill another company, we just laughed at and rolled right through it. So it was the Mustang Motion newsletter. Name it start creating some of those themes that you're going to build your culture around. And that's an easy first step to get going. Great. And will you leave, uh, where can people connect with you? How can we get the book? Well, probably the best way is to go to culturecodechampions.com. And there's a bunch of videos there on organized by the different steps. There's a lot of material there. The book goes through the steps at each step, just, Look at things that we did, and we did it in eight different industries. Each industry that we went into, the salespeople and the leaders said, this industry will never do it the Mustang way. All eight of those industries, we got contracts, relationships, and everything the way we had done it in upstream. So we did it in downstream, midstream, pipeline, automation, LNG, industry. We did it for Boeing in their Charleston plant. It works the clients will eat it up. So start those steps. Culturecodechampions.com is probably the best place to jump in and get, get going. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. Um, just checking, make sure that we have everything unmuted and Bill's back. I'm back with you. Yep. Every time I've watched uh, this video uh, several times, and every time I watch it, I really enjoy it, and I learn something new every time. Um, and I think at this point, what we want to do is uh, go through some question and answers. And uh, we've got a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Victor um, Willard uh, asked Bill, how does coaching fit into your uh, culture code? I think uh, one of the attributes that every leader has to have is to be a good coach. Uh, we assign mentors to everyone, really coach them on their career, coach them on how they could be involved in the culture and help create a better team. One of the things we didn't have back then is we didn't have mentors and we didn't have coaching. So we were writing this book from scratch, from our experience. Since 2000, there's been a lot better, I think, business books. Before that, the business books would talk about success and some of the conditions that created it, but they wouldn't tell you how to do it. I think since 2000, there have been more good leadership 
and business books that give you how to's. And that's what I wanted to do is give you, here's exact things that you can do. One of my favorite business books, the one that I think I would have liked to have written is Scaling Up 2.0. And if you go through it, it hits all of these culture steps and gives you very specific things to do. And it'll help you coach your leadership team or coach the people that you're working with. Okay. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, this is from the experts. It said, uh, enjoy this. Some of our members, managers of all industries, struggle with retaining young guns because their needs and behavior are not aligning gener uh, generationally differences. What do you see? I think the strength of your organization is how you're bringing in and treating the young people. Because no matter what you say, they are your future. Your, your old hands are gonna retire and you better figure out how to communicate and bring those young guns in. One of the things we did is we had a young guns program. So by year group, they all got to know each other and circulated around and, and got better knowledge. And they were assigned mentors. Three years in, then they were mentoring another young guns group. So we were really welding the younger people together. And after about 15 years of our young gun program, the young guns who didn't know squat when they came in, but they knew computers, which we didn't know at that time, they took us to a whole new level and they were able to communicate much better. And they moved into the leadership positions, they moved into corporate staff, and eventually became CEO of the company. So working on those millennials uh, in the young guns, one of the things we did is we got them involved in a lot of activities to where they would create opportunities for them to do pictures that they could put on social media. I'll never forget at uh, one of our anniversary parties, six young guns came in and they were all painted blue with Smurf hats on and got pictures with everybody. But those Smurf pictures, they put those all over social media. And if you can help make them heroes in social media, to all of their compatriots say, man, you're at the best company I've ever heard of. Then if you make them a hero on social media, they'll stay long-term and they'll help you make heroes within your teams. Okay, very good. We have another question here from uh, Jonah Bont. What was the website for interesting team uh, building exercises on Zoom? If you go to culturecodechampions.com, uh, I have a number of videos that you can use to show people on Zoom and then talk about them, talk about the specific subject. So I have about a hundred short videos there that give uh, little snippets of things that we did and, and how that changed the culture. So you can grab those and use those on Zoom and then have a discussion with the leadership team. Okay. Another question. You described the various steps for creating a energized culture in Mustang, and you briefly touched on how you worked with customers. Customers are such an important part of the company's success. Can you describe in more detail about how you incorporate your customers into the Mustang culture and what customer what the customer response was? Like, likewise for suppliers. Um, how important, and lastly, how important was the Mustang culture in the customer relationship relative to just lower costs? There's a long question for you, but <laughs> How do, you, how do you get your clients involved? And one of the things that we did is we put crazy signs up in the uh, parking garage. So as you drove in, there was this big cowboy saying, howdy, partner, watch your head and go slow and different safety signs. But they were sort of fun and creating a theme of, wow, this is not a normal company that I'm just pulling in the garage. Of. Then they'd walk in and the receptionist, would just welcome them, bend over backwards, had a lot of energy and would get them connected right away. And so what was happening to these clients, they'd say, 
man, if I went to Fleur or Bechtel or any other engineering firm in Houston, I'll never have a reception like this. So what you're trying to do is start to change their mentality and say, wow, maybe I'm dealing with something different here. And once they start to see that difference, we have clients, we take them down the hallways and they said they could feel the energy in the hallway, the positive attitude, and they could just sense that they were gonna get an entire team effort, not a siloed organization where they were gonna to have to work the communication. And so once they got the feel for that and once they actually experienced us, what would happen is those clients, when they were in partner meetings, they would tell, partner like Conoco or Marathon or whoever that said, man, you got to go check out this company because it's totally different, a different feel. And they just smoked our project. So suck those clients in. Like I said, we got them to wear the hats and do everything because they felt that if they could become part of the team, it was going to reflect back on them. And we did the same thing with the vendors. And both clients and vendors, we would invite them to our shrimp boils. We'd invite them to our chili cook-offs. Some of the clients and vendors would actually be on chili cook-off teams to where they were experiencing that culture of Mustang. And then you just have ambassadors. And if you can get it to where around the world, people are talking positively about you in conference rooms and fabrication yards and supplier shops without you being there, that's where you're really starting to win. And all of that, what I wanted to do, my partners would laugh at me, is I wanted every project in the world coming towards Mustang to where then my partners could pick the ones that they wanted. And what happened across time is we got to that point to where then we could pick the best projects in the industry, put the best people on them, and then you're definitely the team everybody wants to join. Very interesting. Uh, we got some more questions coming in from the audience. Uh, back to coaching. What are your views on coaching culture as part of building healthy cultures and how do you help leaders be better coaches? I think a key thing is for the leaders to work as a team. So we would normally pick a business book and we would read it for that quarter. And the business books that are out there today on culture, on how to get things done, on how to engage people, how to engage on social media, they're very good and they can stimulate the discussion to where the leaders are now talking about, well, how would I implement that in my project or in my team? And then that's going to make them better coaches. And, and it's really just sharing their brain power across the other leaders in the organization I think using these business books is a, a good way to stimulate that. It doesn't take much time. You can do it over lunch hour. Very interesting. Uh, question from Carlo Arioldi. Uh, what was the role of having a well-defined business slash corporate strategy for building a strong culture? I think it was very important. Uh, we didn't pay a lot of attention to strategy until we sold to the wood group because we didn't have a boss. So we just sort of did our thing and uh, would work with each of our departments or our sectors that were in different industries and what their plan was for the year. But essentially we went into each year with zero growth motive. What we told our people is we just want you to maintain what you have next year because you've got a really good team, you're doing really good work. Don't worry about growing. And we let the industry force us to grow. So a little bit of a different strategy. Once we got with Wood Group, they wanted us to put some numbers on what that growth was going to be. But when we did our strategic document, we ended up with you know, five buckets that we were gonna work on during the year. And in each case, we would say why that goal was important and why it was important to culture, and then what would be the ramifications if we didn't do that. So when we were talking to our people about these goals that we had now codified and put numbers to and KPI metrics to, or people didn't feel like it was a big change, it all made sense and they saw how it related to what they were doing every day. So 
I think you need the strategic plan. What we did is in December, we issued the plan for the year. In May, we did a May reforecast because by then you knew whether the plan was working or not working for that year because yeah. the big stone rolls and crushes everything. So in May, we'd do a reforecast. In August, we would do a, a reforecast, which would try to nail the fourth quarter to where you you knew what your numbers were going to be. And those reforecasts, because it was those steps every year, people knew their numbers, knew what they were trying to do. And so it was in the back of their mind, but they could just operate as they normally did. And then the, we would touch base those four times throughout the year. Okay, good. Uh, we've got another question from uh, Fernando uh, Frim. Was Mustang able to keep the culture you created after being acquired by the Wood Group? That's a good question. <laughs> There's some Mustangers out there right now going, no, they didn't. But uh, what happened is Sir Ian Wood, so he was knighted. Sir Ian Wood and his leadership team, when they bid for us, the reason we picked them, and we could pick from four, we, we did a bid process, so it got down to, to four people. And we announced that we were going to sell the company because uh, we just couldn't look at our people with a straight face, having a sale process going, and word would get out, and they'd ask us, and we, we couldn't lie. So on a Monday morning, I had my minister come in. We said a prayer, and then to the leadership team, we said, we're going to sell, and here's a pamphlet on why we're selling and what we're trying to do and how we want to keep the culture. And then we think we can pick the company that's going to want to keep our culture. And so it got down to four people. Uh, it took nine months to pick it. During that nine months, we won the biggest projects in the world while we were for sale, which is totally unusual. Normally when you're for sale, nothing comes in. We picked Wood Group because culture was very important to them and they knew that all of our people could go to work the next day in one of a hundred other firms in Houston. And we said, the reason they're staying together is the culture we've created. So Sir Ian and his leadership team were totally focused on culture. About six years later, Sir Ian Wood started to move out and his second in command changed. My partner and I retired out in 2008 and we still had the culture in real good shape eight years after the sale. Steve Knowles took over. So he, we'd been building him up across time and went another four years with him. But during that time, the leadership team changed at Wood and they started becoming more focused on stock price and things like that and had less focus on culture. And so then probably starting around 12 years in, culture started taking a second seat. And uh, Michelle McNichol, she took over from Steve Knowles. And I think when she ended up leaving in 2017, her main reason for leaving uh, Wood Group Mustang was their lack of focus on the culture. So she's now started her own company, Arion, totally focused on culture, doing Mustang 2.0, pretty gung-ho, and it's working. So it did stay for quite a while. There's still an undercurrent. There's about 800 people that uh, share a Facebook page and are still share all the stories of Mustang and they still have that feeling. I was called into a room maybe four years ago and they had 120 children of Mustangers that were now working at Mustang saying how it impacted their family and their life. So all of that continued it's not quite as good as it was. The company is still there, but there's lots of little Mustangs where groups of Mustangers went off to other companies and you could bottle that culture. And that's what I tried to do with this book. They bottled the culture and took it with them. Very interesting. Another uh, question, recently in remote forums, what have you found that works best to get people who don't know each other well engaged and participating. I think you need to have a little bit of fun and, and you need to find out personal things about them. One of the first things we did at Mustang, so we bought our furniture at 
five cents on the dollar from engineering firms that were closing in Houston. And I'll never forget, uh, Don Lineriver was putting a big book up on one of our particle board shelves and it just collapsed and all the books were around him. And so I said, ah, we need to build some strong bookshelves. So I invited everybody over to my house and in the garage and in the driveway, we built 10 bookshelves that could hold up anything. These were definitely over-engineered. Well, while we were working together, it was just like a Boy Scout or a church function where you're getting together. We learned about hobbies that people like. They brought their kids. We met their kids. And if you can start to engage and get to know those people, then they're going to start saying, and, and we heard it in that drive where they said, oh, these guys are like normal people. I've never been to an owner's house before. And uh, my two partners were like, like Felix, he was staining the shelf and he had more stain on him, I think, than was on the shelf. But the people got to know us as individuals. And if you can keep doing that connection, even as you grow and get your leadership team to do it, then you, you build that culture where people want to take care of each other. We have another question from Adam Young. Did you ever look to your competitors for guidance? Which of the main EPC companies did you have the most respect for? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> what tell you what we did is we pretty much ignored our competition. Uh, we figured, especially starting in the fourth year when we realized our differentiation was our culture, we just said, we're just going to take off and do our thing and we're going to suck a vacuum on the industry and challenge the industry to follow us and do what we're doing. And so what we saw across time was a number of other companies started to work more on engaging with their people, getting a little bit more in culture. But it's really tough, I think, for the large EPC companies to break the silos down. They were just too ingrained in them. There were other smaller companies like uh, Paragon and uh, some of the smaller ones that, you know, were 100, 150 people that would start implementing because through the drafting room, drafting room was like the telephone throughout the industry. Through drafting rooms, they would know what we were doing, what was going on. And our competitors, all of them were telling us through our drafting room that don't worry in a year, a year and a half, they'll stop doing all this stuff because it's just too hard. And when you invest your time in people, they're going to burn you because they're going to leave and drop you. And you're going to have that. Uh, people are going to leave for various reasons and you can't take it personally. You have to stay true to what you're trying to do. And 10, 15, 20 years later, we were still doing the same thing. And we were 10 times the size of those companies that were talking about us in those early days. We were still doing it. So a number of them started to, but uh, the, the big companies I don't think could ever do it. Um, growing rapidly, which Mustang did, can be a significant uh, challenge from a management point of view, a company culture point of view and a financial point of view. Can you describe a little more in a little more detail some of the experiences that Mustang had and how you dealt with the growing with growing so rapidly? Growth is tough. Uh, my partner Paul Redman, one of his favorite sayings was that the booms are just as hard to manage as the busts. Because in the bus, you're trying to get work and keep people busy, and in the booms, you're trying to find good people, incorporate them into your culture and not lose what you're trying to do. What we found was the key thing for growth was to develop these leaders of character top to bottom in the organization to where everybody at all levels wanted that culture because it was helping their family, it was helping their community, it was making their job the best that they'd ever had. And I remember one time we're in a conference room, got about 30 people in there and we're presenting to Conoco. And Conoco says, well, when you bring in a new person, how do you, uh, how do you get them into the culture and get them to do these things that you're talking about? And Randy Hewitt, who is our head of uh, scheduling said, Bill, let me answer that question. 
really say in a court of law, don't let somebody answer a question unless you know what they're going to say. But I let him answer the question. He says, well, we just take them in the corner. We just beat on them until they realize they're going to be part of the culture. But that wasn't what we did. But he was head of controls group. And one of the things that we did do is we had what I called a blue layer that went across all of the departments. And in that blue layer, blue layer was the project controls people because they were on all projects working schedule and cost. And the leadership team would touch all these projects and HR across the company. And our secretaries, our personal assistants were across everything that was happening in the company. So that blue layer, I encouraged them to let us know when somebody was having troubles. And so you have a lot of ears to the ground in that blue layer trying to keep the culture and they would identify somebody who was having troubles. And then we could get, as a leadership team, we could go support them and help them out. So I, I think you have to work it. It has to be intentional and you can never stop. It's like piling sand. As soon as you stop, Piling that sand, it's going to go back the way normal industry is. Hmm. Uh, another question for you, Bill. Uh, did you have a mentor, or how did Mustang go about learning to make company culture work and know what to do? I think uh, my main mentors were uh, leadership at West Point and then leadership in the Army. When I got out and went into the civilian world, didn't really have mentors. Uh, within the first two years of Mustang, we hired four owners of previous companies that were like Mustang. And these different owners had taken their companies from zero to 30 people or zero to 100 people. And we thought when we hired them in that, wow, these people have been there, done that. Yeah, their company's gone and they're having to come back to work. That's sort of a negative. But we could ask them things. And when we would talk to them, uh, they said, you're doing things like we never did. Your heart's in it. We never allowed ourselves to be that vulnerable. And so we really ended up, like I said in the video, we didn't end up having any mentors ourselves. We just learned as we went, found what worked throughout, what didn't work. And uh, across time, just developed this formula and uh, that's what I'm trying to give to you. We took that same formula to 15 offices internationally. And there's Mustangers. <laughs> My partner wasn't sure there were Mustangers outside of Texas A&M. But there's Mustangers in every industry and in every country. And it's people who just want to be respected for what they do and respected as an individual and challenged. And so in our international offices, we would put a cadre of Mustangers and take this culture and it was eaten up worldwide. So it, it's something that translates well. It's not that hard to do, but you have to be intentional about it. Hmm. Uh, another question for you, Bill. Um, you talked about change and how you prepare your organization for change and to accept change. How important was innovation and creating innovation for Mustang to stand out in the industry to succeed. Did one come before the other? That's interesting. When, uh, after Woodgroup bought us, we did get some external coaches to come in, some consultants, some leadership coaches to come in and start uh, coaching the 25 people that we thought were the key leaders to where we could weld them better together as a team. And one of the things we did is we wanted to come up with what our core values were. And so I remember in a meeting, like 23 words were thrown up on the whiteboard and then everybody raised their hands and we voted on them and boiled it down to six core values. And then I had to pull rank <laughs> because innovation was up there and innovation was not one of the core values that these 25 people in the leadership team thought should be one of the core values. And so I explained the history of Mustang and that if we had not been on the cutting edge of innovation every year, we would have fallen behind. 
So when we started, there was no computer aided design. It was just starting in the industry and only the big companies had it. But I love compact computer because they created these PCs that could run a program the size that could do computer aided design. So we started in July of 87 on the same day anniversary wise that they landed a man on the moon saying this was our moonshot. And we said in July of 87 that we want to do computer aided design. And we sold our first computer aided design drawing to a client in August. So less than six weeks later, we were doing computer aided design and we were ahead of everybody in our industry at our size. And so innovation, I thought was key. We did make it one of our uh, key values. And I, I think part of the engineering mindset is, well, that's just what we do, we innovate. But if you don't put it up there, I don't think it'll get thought about and uh, as strongly as it could be. Yep. Uh, we're running up against our time. Uh, I have one more question for you, and then I think uh, we'll call it a day. Proper functioning teams are important for any project. Is that all part of good company culture, or did you have to do something above and beyond company culture for teams to function properly? Uh, the key thing I'd like people to understand is when I talk about culture, it's the flip side of leadership. I didn't talk about just the fun stuff, you know, getting out paper airplanes, having putt putt golf, things like that. You have to have a repeatable process. You have to sell while the shop is full. You have to reduce turnover and get really good people in. And so culture is part and parcel to good project teams. And I don't think you can have one without the other. And if you're gonna be profitable and stay long-term and have long-term sustainability, and if you don't wanna work yourself to death, one of our key things when we sold the company is if we could keep the same people there that we had, our job was gonna be easy. If those people left, mm -hmm. it was gonna be hard because we have to recreate it all. So if you can keep them, keep those teams together, build that culture, then it starts it's got its own momentum and it'll keep going. So I think they're totally tied to each other, Dave. Uh, very true. Um, well, I think we're uh, out of time, but Bill, I want to thank you very much for just a fantastic talk and answering some of the questions uh, about uh, culture and what uh, companies might do for the future. So thank you very much. And um, for everybody who attended, thank you very much for attending. And we'll see you next time for our next uh, program, which should be on search of extraterrestrial intelligence. So <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. And bye -bye. goodbye for now. <laughs>